So as I sit down and uh, prepare to give you this message, I just want to let you know that this last week has been incredible. Um, many, many hours spent. I would say this has been a 70 plus hour week. If I just had to take a conservative estimate of just the time and much prayer, uh, consultation, talking to fellow community leaders, pastoral leaders. And I come to you this morning first as an ambassador of Jesus Christ and as a messenger of his gospel of peace. I come as a lead pastor of a congregation here in Newcastle, Indiana. And I also come as a community leader concerned for our community and all the communities of the world. Every day this week, the Lord has been waking me up earlier than normal which is not uncommon normally, except for right after a change in time. Uh, that would not be expected. But I now know why the Lord has been getting me up earlier and earlier every morning. And this morning was no exception. And in fact, this morning the Lord gave me a message as both an ambassador of the gospel of Jesus Christ, as a pastor of a local church, and as a community leader. I'm going to be reading it. I'm going to be preaching it. This is not going to be a normal type of message. So if you're unfamiliar with my preaching, you can go back and listen to last Sunday's message on our webpage. Um, but this message is for today, for right now. And I know that this message has the covering of the elders of First Baptist Church and my fellow pastors at First Baptist Church and the leaders of First Baptist Church. And so now, as I come to bring you this message, I pray, Father, use these words to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. The comfortable. I pray, Father, God, that these words will lead us because your Holy Spirit is the one who leads us. Jesus Christ, be the head of your church now. I am but an under-shepherd. I come to speak, but I come to listen first. Let us all now have a posture of humility and a posture of listening for this day and every day. In Jesus' name, amen. So I put aside the sermon I wrote for this Sunday in the reality that we must respond to this 9-11 moment of this generation. The coronavirus, technically COVID-19, this international pandemic has slowly creeped into all of our lives, starting from a distance, a great distance, but now is impacting the lives of most every person in the world. It was at one time a distant conversation with no impact on most of our lives, but now it is damaging economies, closing colleges and schools, shutting down sporting events, locking down military bases, nursing homes, prisons. In fact, I was supposed to preach at the prison tomorrow night, but they are not allowing anyone to come in. There's an enemy at our gate, but instead of one that very visibly flies airplanes into towers and threatens the American way of life, this enemy invisibly threatens to overwhelm our existing medical infrastructure and simply stated threatens every life, not just a way of life. On 9-11-2001, I was a captain on active duty in the U.S. Army and was away from my home on assignment at Fort Carson, Colorado. I remember the moment the planes flew into the towers. I remember the moment someone told me I was in line at Burger King getting my breakfast before heading to my day's meetings. Needless to say, for all of us soldiers at that time and for every American, life changed not just for us soldiers, but for everyone. The base locked down. Airports closed for the day. In fact, I was on one of the very first flights out after 9-11, flying out of Colorado Springs, returning to my home at Moffett Airfield, where my wife anxiously waited to be reunited with me. And life was different. There were soldiers in our airports, and people were scared. And I know people 19 years later from 9-11 who still are scared. 
In the same way that the National Guard was called in to protect us in 2001 and Americans experienced a change of lifestyle, this time it is our health department who has been called in to work for our safety and our security in the face of an enemy that once again threatens our safety and our security. An enemy that is confronting the illusion of invulnerability that we Americans like to return to as quickly as possible. In both cases, 9-11 and today with the coronavirus, we're called to respond to an enemy at our gate. We must respond as a community, as a church, as a people, as a nation, as one people, our response will be different time, different this time than it was after 9-11, 2001, because the threat is different. But this one thing I know, God is with us. And the enemy may have different packaging, but the enemy is the same. Fear. Fear that leads to panic. Panic. Fear that leads to hoarding. Fear that leads to gross neglect of one's neighbor. Fear that leads to disobedience. As I was reading from the Psalter this morning, that's the book of Psalms, which is part of my daily, early morning rhythm of getting in the yoke of Jesus Christ. So every morning, just as a side note, and I'm not saying this because I want you to think that I'm better than you or I'm holier than you. I'm saying this because right now, I want you to learn how to get in the yoke of Jesus because Jesus says, if you are weary and heavy burdened, if you are feeling crushed and exhausted from everything that's bombarding you, then Jesus says, come take my yoke upon you and learn from me who is gentle and humble in heart and, I will, and you will find rest for your soul for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And so there are ways, there are practical ways I can help you from learning how to do this, how to get in the yoke of Jesus, and he will give you rest. So every morning I get up early, about an hour before my family. Lately it's been more like two to three hours before my family, and I read a couple chapters from the Old Testament. I meditate upon those, which means I think about it. And then I read and reflect on at least one psalm, and I write what's called a breath prayer, which I'll teach you that in a moment because that's an important skill. And then I read a chapter of the New Testament, I journal, I pray, I reflect, and I, and I focus. What I'm doing in that time is I'm focusing my mind and my heart on Jesus. I'm getting my body in rhythm with Jesus. Because when I wake up, I wake up anxious, or I wake up ambitious, or I wake up ambivalent. And I need to submit all those emotions to God and learn how to find rest for my soul every day. And this was the psalm I was reading from this morning. It's Psalm 64. And I'm just going to read to you the last couple of verses. The Bible says, Then all mankind fears. You hear that? All mankind fears. All humanity fears. They tell what God has brought about and ponder what God has done. Verse 10 let the righteous one rejoice in the Lord and take refuge in him. Let all the upright in heart exult. Let all the upright in heart bring glory, exult. So I want to teach you what I've been learning how to do for quite a while now. And what I'm going to teach you is called a breath prayer because I want to give you practical skills on how to handle these days. And so what you do, because God cares about your whole body, your whole person, he cares about your life. He cares about your physical well-being, your mental, emotional, spiritual well-being. God is not a distant God. He's a personal God who cares about you. He, so get in a posture to focus your mind and heart in God. That can be laying in your bed. That can be sitting. For me, it's sitting and getting in a posture where I can breathe. And this is biblical, okay? I just want to say, just because I'm talking about posture and breathing doesn't mean it's some weird new age thing, okay? This is biblical. This is, this is what God teaches us to do, and it's a combining just common sense principles with his word. Take a deep breath in your nose, and as you breathe in through your nose, take about five to seven seconds to do that, say these words in your mind and your heart. The Lord is my refuge, 
Then you hold it for a minute, you focus your mind on that truth, and then you breathe out through your mouth, fear not, I am with you. So you breathe in, the Lord is my refuge. You hold it, then you breathe out, fear not, I am with you. What you're doing there is you are meditating upon, focusing your mind on the promises of God. Because it is in the promises of God that we can take our faith in Jesus Christ and that faith will affect, those promises will affect our mind, our heart, our body, our soul. As you breathe in the truth that the Lord is my refuge, which is in Scripture so many places, the Lord is my hiding place, the Lord is my rock, when you breathe in that truth and you hold it in you, focusing on you, then you breathe out fear. Fear not, for I am with you. You are doing that, and you keep doing that until you feel yourself calm down, to your mind relaxes and gets out of that beta phase of your, your fight or flight syndrome that the media and all the misinformation on social media that's out there, it helps you get yourself around something that's true. Reading your Bible and praying, including what I'm calling a breath prayer. You can just call it praying the scriptures if that feels for you. These are not new practices, but they're new to so many of us because we have this faith that's compartmentalized from our everyday life. But right now, friends, with the enemy at the gate, we cannot afford to have a compartmentalized faith. We need a faith that will help us have peace of mind. Fear not, for I am with you. God is with us. God wants to align your whole human person to his will and his ways. And trust me when I tell you this. Please hear the empathy, the compassion, the sympathy. Fear will find a way into your mind, heart, body, and soul if your faith is nothing more than an intellectual understanding of God. Because fear, being scared, being nervous, being worried, that's a reality of living in a broken world. God knows that. God knows that this is part of the human condition. And God is inviting us to a better way to deal with our fear. God is inviting us today to give us a better way to deal with our worry and anxiety because I, am, I have nothing but compassion and empathy for anyone that's fearing feel. If you're feeling fear or anxiety or worry, I get it. I understand. I'm not judging you at all. I understand. I just want you to be healthy. I want you to think right. I want you to be a good neighbor. I want you to love your neighbors yourself. I want you to be the church. I want you to be a loving person at a time when so many people are hoarding and so many people are hurting other people and fighting over things that maybe a week ago they would have thought, no way would I be fighting over toilet paper or something like that. But people do crazy things when they're scared. And that's not a judgy statement. That's just the reality of the human condition. The reason the Bible, the reason God talks so much about the human experiences of fear and anxiety and worry is because he knows they're real. And he knows we're all going to struggle with them. He knows they're going to rob you of your joy. These are life-threatening realities. You see, the enemy at the gate is going to stir up the enemy within you. Your own fears and phobias. It's going to cause us to be xenophobic, which means we're going to fear our neighbor instead of loving our neighbor. And God has a better way. In this broken, fallen world, people fly airplanes in the buildings. I don't know why they do. And viruses exist that threaten national security and community well being. It's true. For me to ignore that fact and not join you in that reality would be to be a false prophet. And you would not believe a thing I have to tell you. So I'm, I'm, I'm with you at that. But there's a better way. God is with us. Please lean into this. Let me give you a biblical principle from the Bible. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to do this. I'm going to reinforce this a couple times because this is a principle that is so important for this day, for this season, for this 9-11 moment 
as we deal with the coronavirus. But friends, this is true for every day. So go with me, if you have your Bible, to Ephesians chapter 4. It's in the, in the New Testament. And listen to this, this principle that I'm going to read to you from the Scriptures. Ephesians 4, 26 to 27. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down in your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Here's what we need to know. And I'm picking this verse because I think we all understand a little bit about the human emotion of anger. I think this is a universal experience as well. Anger is real, true? The Bible says be angry. The Bible is not saying anger is a sin. The Bible says right here, be angry and do not sin. When you have a real human emotion, do not give yourself over to it and then sin. Fear, anxiety, worry are real human emotions. I'm not telling you to stop having real emotions. I am just telling you God says don't sin in them. Don't give your life over to them. Don't start making decisions based upon those human emotions. What we need to do is we need to acknowledge that we're feeling that emotion. Then we need to make a decision to not give ourselves over to it by confessing it and repenting of it. Repenting simply means to turn away from it. And then we need to deal with the situation. The Bible says here, do not let the sun go down on your anger. That means we need to quickly deal with the situation faithfully and with wisdom in such a way as to invoke God's power and God's presence. And that's why it says here, do not give the devil an opportunity. Because if you give yourself over to the human emotion, let's say sexual desire, you're married, you've got a great spouse at home, you're at work, or you're out, and you all of a sudden feel this emotion, what you do in that moment determines everything. Because you're a human, you're going to have different emotions. Don't give yourself over to them. In that moment, confess it, repent of it, turn away from it, give yourself to God. Give yourself to God. Don't give the devil a foothold. This teaching is focused on the human emotion of anger, but what about ambition? What about fear? What about depression, worry, anxiety? And I know that there are some conditions out there, like I mentioned depression. I know some of those things are biological, part of the fallen world we live in. So I'm not talking about if you have a medical condition. Please talk to your doctor. Get good wisdom from the medical community. I am talking about those of us, though, who have ex these experiences where we feel overwhelmed and, and, and we let ourselves dig a hole and then we give ourselves a pity party or we... We've got to rise above that. The Lord invites us to this principle of following and trusting the promises of God. Listen to this. Here's another one to reinforce it. Go to Philippians. Philippians 4. This is a, such a good one and relevant for today. Philippians 4, 5 to 7 says this. The Lord is at hand. This is Philippians chapter 4, the end of verse 5 through 7. The Lord is at hand. In other words, God is with us. Did you hear that? God is with us. The Lord's at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So let's apply this principle right now. Anxiety is real. Just as real as the fact that God is with us, anxiety is real. The Bible is not saying... That anxiety is not real here. And do you know what anxiety is? Anxiety is generalized fear. Like a spider web that captures us. When there's an enemy at the gate, we might not see the spider, but we're in the web. And all these crazy things start going on in our heads. By the way, that's kind of an illustration from The Hobbit, The Lord of the Rings. For Americans... And for many of us, anxiety is the current reality, if not a predisposition that's being exposed. I don't want to overstate that, and I don't want to diagnose you, let the Holy Spirit do that, but I think for many of us in America and the West, anxiety is a predisposition of the heart that's easily triggered. 
So what do we do with that? We name it. Say, I'm feeling anxiety right now. I don't know what I'm scared of, but I'm scared of something. I'm feeling really nervous. Sometimes that manifests in panic attacks. Sometimes that manifests in other ways. Name it, acknowledge it, and then cast it upon the Lord. Don't give yourself over to it. That's what it's talking about here. When it says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. It's saying, acknowledge the fact that you're feeling anxious, and now count your blessings. Look at all the things that God has done for you. Look at all the ways you can talk to him. Go to him boldly. Bring your fears to him. Deal with the situation quickly through prayer and thanksgiving. And then what happens? Just like in the last verse in Ephesians 4, you will see the devil flee because God's peace will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And here, God's peace guarding is a military imagery. God is guarding you and protecting your mind. Again, one more time. Let's go to James chapter 4 because I want you to get this principle. Repetition helps us learn. Helps us learn. James chapter 4 verses 6 to 8 check this out this is so important here we are the bible says in james chapter 4 verses 6 to 8 but god gives more grace therefore the bible says god opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble submit yourselves therefore to god resist the devil and he will flee from you Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. So let's look at the principle. Pride. Pride is a real threat. And I'm going to talk about in a minute how pride was a real threat to our church just in the last 24 hours. Pride is the opposite of humility. Pride is the opposite of being meek like Jesus, gentle and humble in heart, and submitting yourself to God. So what do you do when you feel pride, when you feel arrogant? And I would say, once again, for a lot of us, this is just part of the DNA of being an American. We just, we can get it done. We can just get it done. We can work through this, okay? So we need to confess and repent of our pride by humbling ourselves before the Lord. And then we need to deal with this situation quickly. In this case, in James 4, by drawing near to God, resisting the devil's urging to give ourselves over to arrogance, over to we can get this done on our own. We don't need anyone's help, thank you. And then what happens? James says, if we apply this principle, confront the, the emotion, acknowledge it, and then invite God into that place, God will draw near to us. The God of peace will be with us. And I could go on and on. There are so many illustrations, but I think you got it now. Usually three illustrations should, should help, I hope. If you need more, let us know on Facebook Live. Let us know on our webpage. Shoot us an email. Let us know you need more of this teaching. Let us know you, if you need practical skills on how to have mental sanity, how to have good mental hygiene practices, of how to apply the principles of God in real ways, let us know so I know to do more of that teaching. I could go on and on. In fact, as you're hearing on the Christian radio, as, as many Bible teachers, many Bible teachers are, teachers are teaching right now, there are so many verses about fear. Fear not. In fact, there's so many, you could have one for every day. I even heard one guy say, there's even enough to include leap year. Well, thank goodness, because this is a leap year, and we need it. But that does not mean, just because it's talked about hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times in the Bible, doesn't mean you get it. I'm here to help you get it. Because you still will experience fear, anxiety, worry, and all these other human emotions, anger. The key is what you do in that moment. Do you know you have a way of victory? A promise from God is this, from 1 Corinthians. So the first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 10, verse 13. This is a promise, promise of God. No temptation has overtaken you. That means anybody who's listening, anybody in the sound of my voice. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. In other words, there's nothing new under the sun. If you're going through something like we're going through right now as a community and as a nation, this is not uncommon. This has happened before. There have been plagues. The church has responded wisely to these situations in the past. We just need to do it in our generation. 
The Bible says God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation, he'll also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Did you hear that? God has a way of escape for his people. There is a way of victory in this time as there is in every human encounter with fear. Let me say it again. There is a way of victory in every encounter with fear, anxiety, depression, ambition, pride, anger you name it there's a way of victory there's a there's a scripture there's a word there's a promise there's a principle god is with you god is with you this is his promise god will never leave you god will never forsake you nothing can take you out of the father's hand god has secured you in the love of jesus christ you are eternally sealed with the indwelling of the holy spirit covered with the blood of jesus You are more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. You're a child of God, a son and daughter of the King. In Christ, nothing, nothing can take away that security. Nothing. God is with us. God is with you. It's his promise. It's his promise. This is his promise. And I have said this over and over. I think this is my fifth, fourth or fifth communication to you this week about the coronavirus, about how we are responding. And let me tell you, every day, almost every hour of every day, there's been escalation. There has been increased communications. But I'll let you know every step of the way, the Lord has been with us. The Lord has been with us. And that's why I put out on, this, on, the, on, the, on State Road 3 in our community, I put out a sign that said, remain calm and pray. God is with us. Because this is the message of faithful Christians in the midst of feeling real emotions. We feel them too, friends. If you're listening and you're not yet a Christian, we feel it too. Okay, we are not, um, we are not so separated from this world that we don't feel real emotions and have real struggles and real temptations too. We feel them. The reality is we acknowledge that we're feeling them. We don't give ourselves over to them. Lord, help us so that we can respond differently. And that's what this message is about. With all this biblical teachings, I am calling the church of Jesus Christ to respond in faith as our communities are being confronted by an enemy at the gate the reason we are canceling programs and events for starting today for two weeks is not because we're scared. That is not what's driving this. Yes, we experience fear like everyone else, but we have submitted that. Your elders and your leaders have submitted those emotions to the Lord so that we can make faithful decisions. We are providing online services this Sunday and next Sunday instead of in-person services so that we can lock arms with our community leadership and the health department to respond as one people. The church of Jesus Christ loves the community. And we are locking arms with the Henry County Health Department and with the leadership. This is not a lack of faith, anything but that. Your elders, your staff, your leaders, we have been praying. We are faithfully responding to the needs of the community. This is a community cooperation effort that shows our community that we love them. We are committed to them and that we're here to serve them. We're not here just to serve our own needs. It's so easy just to say, we're gonna do our own thing and we're gonna forget about everyone else and I am not judging anyone out there and the decisions other churches are making. We have simply decided with other churches in our community to walk with the health department. Our vision at First Baptist Church is this. Our vision is we desire to see communities thriving to the glory of God. That's our, actually, you can look on the webpage. That's our vision statement. We didn't make that up for today. We're not trying to do some spin of why we are doing our services online. We are actually, as the elders and leaders of the church, we're trying to fulfill our vision statement. And so yesterday, when the elders and pastors were at the health department meeting and then we met for prayer afterwards, I asked the question. I said, health department of Henry County, our vision statement is we desire to see communities thriving to the glory of God. What is the best way the Church of Jesus Christ can fulfill that vision right now? How can we bring human flourishing to our community and fulfill Jesus' command to love our neighbor as ourselves right now? And before I tell you their answer, I'm going to tell you this. If you ever have a Bible study question or a theology question, please come to me. 
man, I've got so much education when it comes to Bible and theology, and, and I got a degree in counseling too, and, and all these good things. But you know what? That's kind of my subject. I like the Bible. I like theology. I like church history. Uh, you know, there are people out there that are smarter than me, obviously. Anybody who knows me knows I'm not the sharpest stick. But this is my area. You know what's not my area? I'm not a medical doctor, and I'm not a, a, a hospital you know, administrator, and I'm not a public health manager. Sorry, those classes were not taught in seminary. So, going back to what the experts who do have the education in health management and medical and community readiness in this area said, they said, you need to let the COVID-19 go through two cycles of exposure and close down the church for two weeks so that you can clean it real good and decrease exposure so that the infrastructure of our hospitals and medical providers don't get overrun like they have in other areas. So, after meeting with the health department officials yesterday, a group of pastors and our, and our elders, you know, after that meeting at 6 o'clock last night, we decided to lock arms with them and make sure we are participating in the journey with our community. This is not a government edict. You know, when a government edict came down early in the week from government Holcomb that we had to have, you know, no more than 250 people in the room, you know what my, our immediate response was? No problem, Governor Holcomb. We are going to increase our services so that we're going to put them in two separate spaces. So when we prepared, we worked hard. We, we created two spaces for two different services so that we could have 250 in each and make sure people from our community come get this word of hope. But you know, within a day, things changed. And that wasn't, that wasn't enough. No one told us we had to do this. This is not the government telling church anything. This is the church choosing to fulfill our mission to the world by cooperating with the healthcare industry and public officials. And let me be honest with you, church. The reason we're not gathering face-to-face -face is because those of you who are the most likely and susceptible to the coronavirus 19 are the probably the ones i would say please don't come to worship but you would come anyways because your whole life if the doors are open you come and even if your young pastor said hey guys anyone over the age of 60 please don't come to church because the statistics show you're the most vulnerable you guys have been like well if the doors are open we're coming because pastor wouldn't have service if it wasn't safe and i love you but in some ways, it's our own stubbornness to want to gather that's preventing us from gathering. And that's not in any way a slap. I think that's wonderful that we want to gather. That's why we're gathering online, because we love you. I, Pastor Ken, your elders, the staff and leaders, we love you so much. We love you so much that we have to kind of be like parents right now. So let's be honest. If we sometimes have to say to our kids, hey, honey, it's not okay for you to do that or you can't have that, and then what do kids do? They kind of throw a tantrum about it, and they want it anyways, no matter what mommy and daddy say, and the parents are like, listen, I know you're going to throw a fit about this, but trust mommy and daddy, we're doing this for your good because this is what's right. We still have to lead. And in no way am I trying to be pejorative in how I say that. I'm not trying to talk down. I am right there with you. I am as stubborn as they get. Lord, help me. You know that. You know that. I love you, and I want us to be faithful to the gospel by not contributing to the problem. It is not more faithful to tell the government and the health department that they can go do whatever they want with their edicts. We're, we're going to do our own thing. That is not more faithful. That is not using wisdom. That is not choosing to trust people uh, with their expertise. So by closing down our large gatherings, because you know, did you know in Henry County, we have a really large gathering. Every week, we have a large gathering. Our church body has probably the potential of becoming the epicenter because of how big we are. That is so much responsibility. And, and I'm going to say this very humbly. Please hear the honesty of my heart. If you haven't sat in the seat 
as a leader of an organization making these kind of decisions, you don't know the agony that I've been through in making this decision and that the elders have come around me. The only reason I'm probably not exhausted and out right now is because I have an amazing associate pastor, an amazing staff, an amazing group of elders that have locked arms with me and are working with me that, ha- that we are making this decision, decision unanimously and together because you can't lead an organization by yourself. We're doing this together. Not just together as a church, but together with the community. So I join with other community leaders in this sentiment. I quote, I don't know who said this first, but I'm saying it second, third, fourth, fifth. I agree with it. In the end, it will be impossible to know if we overreacted or did too much. But it will be quite apparent if we underreacted or did too little. I'll say it again. In the end, it will be impossible to know if we overreacted or did too much. But it will be quite apparent if we underreacted or did too little. We can help decrease the potential of the spread of this virus by meeting online and not doing our normal thing for the next two weeks. Jesus said, actually it was Paul. Paul said that the way we follow Jesus is by being a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing unto the Lord. And I know for many of you, this kicks at the grain of who you are to not be at church today and to not come to prayer meeting on Thursday or Tuesday or not come to Bible study on Monday or Thursday. I'm used to teaching and leading a prayer gathering literally five days a week. I'm going to have to be a living sacrifice for the next two weeks with you. I'm going to miss seeing you. I'm going to miss all that. Just, but just because we don't gather here for those normal events and normal activities and northern, normal large gatherings doesn't mean we're not going to be the church. We are going to be the church because God is with us. God is with us. God is with us. And so there are ways we can move forward together. Before I tell you that, I want to apply the principle. The principle of Ephesians 4, the principle of Philippians 4, the principle of James 4. The, these principles of what do you do when you experience anxiety or pride or anger. And I'm going to show how the elders dealt with this. So first, we acknowledge the enemy is at the gate. And fear is gripping the hearts of people. That's real. We talked to people. We went to a health department meeting. And you know what we did? Multiple days, we brought it to the Lord. We confessed. We repented when necessary. You know the thing we had to repent of yesterday? Our pride. My pride specifically. Thinking that our plan to have two services and to keep all programs and services open no matter what the experts said because we're a people of faith and people of faith are protected and and we're going to do this. Um, Honestly, friends, it was our elders and, and this meeting with the healthcare department and the work of the Holy Spirit to just bring us to a place of humility and not unintentionally co-opt ourselves with this American, American arrogance and this, this, there's a spirit in our culture that doesn't submit to authority. You ever have that problem at church or somewhere where it's hard to submit to authority? Submit to subject matter experts and you can Google and get the answer and tell that doctor or that pastor, well, this is what I think. But you know, right now, it would be foolishness on our behalf to not listen to common sense requests made by the health department in this probably once in a generation situation. And so I have some illustrations for you. Use Lysol wipes, keep your area clean, hand sanitizers, don't touch your face. Wash your hands. Use hot water and soap. 20 seconds. Know that God is in the business of healing. Pray. If you start feeling sick, pray, but also go to your primary care physician and and, and make sure that you get some professional advice. And finally, and above all, 
Pray. Pray, 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 pray. Pray, be faithful, be faithful. And as they used to say in the army, drink water. I know it's not a moment of, of brevity, it's not a moment of being lighthearted, but sometimes the best thing we can do in the face of times such as this is that people in our life we can laugh with, that we can love, that we can be in relationship with. I'm asking you to stay in relationship with your church. I'm asking you to give faithfully. I'm asking you to join us online. I'm asking you to check up on one another. There are so many things we can do. So we, as your elders and leaders and your staff, are leading with this situation quickly. Your moderator, your officers, we are dealing with this situation quickly. That's why we made the decision to cancel um, in-person services and do online services. That's why we closed you know, our ministries down for two weeks because we are joining with the health department to try to stop this before it becomes something. My greatest hope is three weeks from now, you're going to look at me and say, Pastor, you and the elders overreacted. I'm going to say, well, maybe you're right. But I would rather have that conversation with you in three weeks than the conversation in three weeks that says, Pastor, you should have shut the building down because it blew up. And we didn't have the foresight to do anything about it. I'm happy to have that conversation with you in three weeks. To, I would rather you have a conscientious leader who's writing letters every day and blowing up your email and asking you to watch online. I'd rather be that kind of leader who's not scared. If you've read any of my communications to you, you know, I'm a big tough guy. I'm young and I'm healthy. You know, this is a hard decision for me. But it's the right one. And it's the faith decision. It's the wise decision. It's the decision that history will judge. And you know what? Yesterday, all day long, after making the decision to go to two services, which I felt real great about, worked 12 hours to get done, we worked hard. But you know, all day yesterday, I was in a, I was in a place of just being torn apart. But then when the elders met, and we got that wisdom, that counsel from the health department, we made the decision, peace, peace came upon me. Peace. Doesn't mean I had to stop working. We worked late into last night, worked early this morning to be ready. God's peace is guarding our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. I feel peace. I feel a consolation in my spirit. And that's because we're following the principles of God and God is with us. And the peace of God that transcends all human understanding is with us. That doesn't mean it's not scary out there at times, but it means we can walk now into that situation. And so I'm now calling you to action. I'm calling you to action, church, just like the church of Jesus Christ during the, the black plagues went and ministered to the community. I am calling you into action, following the guidelines, following the wisdom that I've given you, remembering what Paul said, for to me to live is for Christ and to die is gain. Having faith with you. Remembering what Paul said in 2 Timothy 1 7, for it is not a spirit of fear that you've been given, but it's a spirit of power and love and sound mind. This is the spirit that God's given us. So, this right here and how we're shutting down the, the ministries and the gatherings for two weeks, this is a first step, but it's not the last step. We're not asking you to stop being the church. We're telling you, we're asking you, we're inviting you to be on the journey with us of now really being the church. Because you can gather on Sunday morning and not be the church, just like you can sit in your garage and not be a car. I'm calling you now to love your neighbors in real and practical ways. So first, First Baptist Church and anyone listen, start calling the elderly people who are already social distanced. The social distancing that we're now being asked to do is only going to exasperate the, the issues of so many people. We have so many elderly people. Did you know the nursing homes are shut down? I was talking to one woman yesterday who has a grandmother in one nursing home and a father in another one, and she can't go see either of them. We need to write letters. We need to send text messages. We need to Facebook in positive ways. Twitter, we don't need to give in to the spirit of fear because we have not been given a spirit of fear. Handwritten notes. I would love to see the younger people of our church start writing handwritten notes to the older people in our community. I'd love to see parents spend more time with their kids. I'd love to see people take some naps over the next couple weeks and rest I'd love for us as a nation to slow down from our addiction to busyness and get some rest for our souls and spend some family time together and play some games. 
because we're going to have some forced rest coming. Help deliver food. You can volunteer with the Henry County Health Department and become a part of the response effort. You can find out who doesn't have food, who doesn't have toilet paper. I know someone's hoarding all the toilet paper and trying to sell it out there. Stop hoarding the toilet paper and give it to your neighbors, okay? We need to share what we have and not live into fear. And I know people are scared right now financially, but trust me, I'm not a prophet nor the son of the prophet, but the stock market's gonna bounce back. Don't be stingy. Now's not a time for stinginess. Now's a time to be generous. Now's the time for the church to shine. FBC is going to be a partner with Henry County. We're gonna, we're gonna let them use this facility if they need it, just like we did with H1N1 back in the day. The question is, will you, as a member of the church, share what you have and be generous? And as, as we always say, don't tell God how big your storm is. Tell your storm how big your God is. And that doesn't mean we ignore it. I hope after 30 minutes or however long it's been of sharing this heart, my heart with you, you're not sitting here going, well, that's a cliche. No, it's a principle of how we protect and guard our minds. It's a truth. We must take sober steps in this time. But we need to go in faith, in wisdom, with partnership, trusting God's providence to use his church in this time. We are God's people. We trust God's promises so we can respond with faith even in the midst of experiencing fear and anxiety and worry. And so to close, and I'm going to ask Emily to come on up here with the team and help us close with a song that we can reflect upon. I want to read to you my favorite psalm in the Bible. I know you're thinking the 23rd psalm. That is also my favorite psalm in the Bible, but this is my other favorite psalm in the Bible. Uh, psalm 91. This is called the soldier psalm. And when the enemy's at the gate, you need to soldier up. And as a former military guy who used to kick down doors, I want to give you some encouragement from the scriptures. This is Psalm 91. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust, for he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night nor the arrow that flies by day nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked because you have made the Lord your dwelling place. The Most High who is my refuge, no evil shall be allowed to befall you. No plague come near your tent, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent. You will trample underfoot, because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him, because he knows my name. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. The 23rd Psalm says, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The 23rd Psalm says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. This is the invitation today of Jesus Christ to dwell in him, to find your peace in him. Do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Have you asked Jesus to forgive you of your sins? Have you gotten right with him? If you're fearful right now, if you're worried and anxious right now, so are so many other millions of people. You are not alone, but there is a God who wants to rescue you and deliver you and give you his salvation. And those gifts of peace, because peace is a gift. Peace is a gift. Peace will guard you. God's presence is your peace. And if you are not experiencing peace right now, then I pray that you'll invite God's presence in your life. I pray that you'll become a dweller in God because these promises are for those who find their hiding place in God. 
And we are asking you to get in the partnership with God, to get into a relationship with him by saying, Jesus, would you be my partner, not just today, but every day? Would you be the lover of my soul? Would you be my peace? I believe that you are the son of God, that you died on the cross, that you gave yourself so that I have my life, that that I may have life. I submit myself to you as God. I know that there is no other security or safety to be found. Even if I followed all the principles of a health department, even if I I had all the, the skills of good psychology, Lord, I know I need the God who protects, the God who gives peace, the God who can cover me in the shadow of his wing. So I come to you right now with this enemy at the gate and I say, God, will you be my protector? Will you be the God of angel armies in my life? So I confess my sins and I ask God that you would forgive me of those sins and that you would be my protector, my provider, that you would forgive me and give me eternal life. And Lord, fill me with the presence and power of your person the holy spirit lord jesus help me to fear not and to know that you are with me and that you are in me in jesus name amen (coughs) i am now going to ask you to respond please respond